So before I begin the substantive part of my talk, just to say, uh, just to acknowledge how uh, how much detail and complexity is uh, goes into doing this hybrid format that we're working on on Saturdays. Uh, you know, uh, when it works, it seems seamless and, and really easy uh, and uh, sometimes behind the curtains, it's a little wild. Uh, but thank you all for for helping with this and for uh, bearing with it uh, because it enables us to to actually have a very wide field uh, at a time when, once again, uh, the uh, COVID virus is, is ramping up and uh, people that we know are getting it and we're trying to be careful. Uh, and, you know, I'll, I'll confess, I was thinking um, last week, you know, or 10 days ago, I was thinking, well, we're doing really well, and let's see. Maybe at, at the end of the practice period, we can we can stop doing our monitoring, and we can sit in the zendo unmasked. And uh, no, nope, not ready yet. Uh, so we just really take it as it comes and do our best. And I just you know I really appreciate. Uh, the thoughtfulness and effort everyone is making. And uh, that particularly goes to, to Gary, uh, who has been very present. And uh, all of us making the effort to create a sense of spaciousness uh, for Gary as a she so that this is a mutual activity. So it's, it's really, uh, it's special. It's a special time, even though it's not necessarily the time we would choose, but this is, you know, what what we've been talking about, uh, the, the setting for the Lotus Sutra that we've been studying in the practice period, the setting is this world, the Saha world, where we are bound to endure all kinds of challenges and difficulties. So thank you all. Um, let's see if this works right. This is going to start with a sound. Let's see if I can do it. Does anyone know everyone, or does anyone know what that is? Morning. Morning. Yes, it's a morning dove. Uh, Susan, uh, I thought it was an owl. Susan uh, corrected me, which was, and then I started looking around. Uh, so.
Let me read you a poem that I wrote. Can't you hear those lonesome doves? Yes, I hear them, morning doves calling to each other. One east, one west, one higher in pitch, one a little lower. Two moons in the mind's sky while we sit at dawn. Morning light pierces the dark curtain and these enchanting visitors speak sweet turning words. Right now, I am nothing but the dove's call. <coughs> Lost in a moment outside of time. So, um, I think right around the beginning of April, I was sitting here in the morning and uh, in morning zazen, which is very peaceful and quiet. And I heard these two birds. Uh, one was seemed to be on that side of the zendo and one seemed to be on that side of the zendo. And they were calling in this way. This went on for much of the period of Zazen. That was just, what can I say? I was just, I was just really struck. It's like, I really heard them. They really, they reached down to the bottom of my mind. It was very wonderful, not a particularly earth-shaking experience, just a really normal experience. You know, and I've been reflecting on it since then. Uh, so I've been sitting here now for nearly 38 years, I never heard them before. I'm sure they were there the whole time. And I never heard them. It reminds me, I think it's something that Ross said in a talk, uh, might have been a couple of years ago, where he was walking up the block and he saw the cypress tree in the, you know, on the curb outside where Mark lives. And I think you said, never you, you never saw it before. And then, uh, then I walked up the block and, you know, thanks to Ross's alert and I saw it and now I see it. Now I see it every time. And now, when I'm sitting here, I can be wa or walking down the block. Came the other day. I was coming back from uh, from Lori and the walk Lori and I had taken. I hear the morning doves everywhere. So this is this is actually just such a wonderful awakening in the context of her practice, to really hear something and uh, it reminds me also of another experience I had like this, which was, wow, it was like 35 years ago, uh, sitting Sashin at Okioji, which is the Minnesota Zen Center's uh, country place in, on the border of, uh, I guess, 
Minnesota and Iowa near the Mississippi River. Is that right? I think. Uh, and we were sitting there at night and the Zendo there was, uh, it was kind of like a year. It had, it had walls and it had then a, a kind of tent roof. And sitting at night, you know, the wind came up and you could hear the, the, the tent cords kind of snapping in the wind. It was like, you know, it was like being on a big sailboat in the, uh, the wind whipping through the, the cords. Uh, and it was just a moment of really hearing. So this is a really important dimension of our practice. It's a way of practicing shikantaza, uh, just hearing, not even listening, just hearing. Uh, to open one's senses and I think of I think of Chikantaza as uh, a kind of a very broad receptivity, where all of your senses are uh, functioning. They're not reaching out to draw things in, but they're functioning and they're open. And you know, we strike this balance. It's just like the balance in our posture uh, that that Sojin Roshi is always speaking about of having the the strength of our uprightness and yet having complete flexibility that there's not a rigidity to it. And in this sense, it's it's listening deeply or hearing deeply, but also hearing lightly. Uh, and this is just to say, this is what I've been trying to practice for the last, I guess the last couple of years, just to sit here and open, particularly open my sense of hearing. Uh, and uh, see what comes up or what doesn't come up, which is also hearing. I'll talk about that in a little. Um, actually, let me suggest wherever you are, whether you're in the Zendo, or you're online, right now, let's just try it for, uh, let's try it for 60 seconds. Just open your hearing. So what did you hear? Does anyone want to say what they heard? Anyone here, Sando? Or train. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear that too. And it's amazing, the Bart train, so it's about 
three, four blocks, and it's under the ground, right? Yeah, anything else? No one's walking. Yeah. Birds. It's an electric car reversing. <laughs> <laughs> what about any of you out there? I heard my okay. wind chimes. An airplane taking off. My we can hear, or I can hear the puppy chewing on something to keep her from barking. So <laughs> it's not loud, but it's loud enough. Yeah. So this is this is a wonderful the refrigerator. Crowd. Yeah, the refrigerator. And, you know, uh, it was uh, the Theravada teacher, Achan Amaro, uh, said uh, uh, Nirvana is like when the refrigerator switches off. <laughs> <laughs> That's, which is really true when you think about it in the middle of the night when the, when the refrigerator switches off, it's like, ah. And right now, also, I hear now we have in the Zendo. I hear the the light hum of the uh, uh, air purifiers, which are going on. So this is the practice that I, you know, I encourage you to think about. Uh, you know, so this is returning to silence. But in a sense, silence is never silent. And uh, this is also bodhisattva practice. The bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara or Kuan Yin uh, is referred to as the one who sees the cries of the world. Uh, so there's a kind of synesthesia there. Uh, and I think this is, you know, in a sense, we understand this when we're doing this hearing that we just did, because the, the sounds appear as sounds, but we're also seeing them as uh, thoughts. As consciousness. And we can do this in the Zazen, in, in, in the Zendo, because uh, it's relatively simple here, it seems. Whereas in, in the rest of our day, uh, often we don't stop to really hear or to really see, you know, to hear the sounds, to see the cypress tree. And, you know, as I ponder, why didn't I ever hear this in 40 years? You know, and then I can't tell you why I did hear it one day. It just, it's just like the stone striking the bamboo rake that, uh, that tiny sound opens your mind in some way. But the not hearing is interesting to me because of what it points me towards is uh, I didn't hear because I was uh, self-centered because I am self-centered, because what I really hear are my thoughts. And what I really see is everything that I'm looking for, or that I'm watching out for, that I'm guarded against, or, uh, or moving towards. Not seeing what is really appearing moment by moment appearing to my mind. And this is true. Just, I encourage you really to think about this, to think about your practice this way. Uh, and 
you can you can begin to hone that here but the real task is to bring it forth into the world into your everyday activities to create some sense of space even in the midst of our tasks and our activities uh -huh. And of course, this goes as well to our relationships, to our connectedness or lack of connectedness to each other. Suzuki Roshi uh, said in a 1967 lecture, when you listen to someone, you should give up all your preconceived ideas and your subjective opinions. You should just listen to them. Just observe what his or her way is. Uh, we put very little emphasis on right and wrong or good and bad. This is from the standpoint of practice. We put very little em emphasis on right and wrong, good and bad. From the standpoint of our self-centered view, uh, we can very quickly arrive at a point where all we see is right and wrong, and good or bad. But from the vantage point of practice, that's not what we emphasize. We just see things as they are with him or her and accept them. This is how we communicate with each other. So as I was researching this um, and kind of looking around to see what the kind of the Buddhist perspective on hearing practice is, uh, I came to the Shurangama Sutra, which is one of the major sutras that I don't think we've ever studied it here. Uh, perhaps we should. Uh, and actually, I'm going to read you something. Uh, Bob Rosenbaum, who many of you know, actually has a new book coming out on the Shurangama Sutra. Uh, it's uh, the title is "That Is Not Your Mind." I, I think we'd have to read it to figure out what that title means, but. Uh, he tells this story uh, that the Buddha is sitting with the, the Arhats and the Buddha instructs Rahula to strike the bell once. Rahula does so and the bell sounds and the Buddha asks everyone in the assembly, do you hear? And Ananda and everyone else responds, yes, we hear. Uh, the Buddha waits until the sound of the bell dies away and asks, now do you hear? Ananda and everyone responds, we do not. The Buddha does this three times asking the same questions each time. Each time he receives the same responses. After the third time, the Buddha asks, why have you given such muddled answers? The listeners protest. What do you mean muddled? When the bell was ringing, we heard it. When the bell wasn't ringing, we didn't hear it. Uh, Bob writes, I'll paraphrase phrase the Buddha's reply. You did not clearly distinguish between hearing and sound. You thought you heard the bell when it was ringing and didn't hear it when it wasn't. In that case, how could you know that the sound had ceased? 
you had to be able to hear the sound's absence. Your true unconditioned hearing awareness, hearing awareness, includes both sound and silence. It is more fundamental than sound and silence. In other words, the, the mental functioning of hearing awareness of hearing consciousness is not dependent upon an object. Or you could say, in the, in the sense of what Buddha was saying, the, uh, silence is an object of our hearing. It's the, the sound of silence. Make a good song title. <laughs> um, this is what you will hear when you, you know, even we just did this, this mo this minute of practice, there were sounds that arose and there were moments when you're hearing ac mental activity of hearing was happening. And there was no particular sound that you could identify with. So I think the, you know, the, the powerful thing is to extend this to all of our sense perceptions and in fact all of our mental activity. I will say, you know, and I've, I've sort of puzzled over this. Uh, sometimes there's some very uh, what seem like very refined instructions or descriptions of the Buddhist practice. Uh, you know, for example, this is also in the Srinagama Sutra. Uh, this is the chapter that relates to uh, Guan Yin, Avalokiteshvara. Uh, he says, I entered into the stream of the self nature of the sense of hearing, thereby eliminating the sound of what was heard. Now proceeding from this stillness, both sound and silence cease to arise. Advancing in this way, both hearing and what was heard melted away and vanished. When hearing and what is heard are both forgotten, then the sense of hearing leaves no impression in the mind. When the sense and objects of sense both become empty, then emptiness and sense merge and reach a state of absolute perfection. When emptiness and what is being emptied are both extinguished, then arising and extinction are naturally extinguished. At that point, the absolute emptiness of nirvana became manifest and suddenly I transcended the mundane and super mundane worlds. So my my incomplete awakening uh, has not come to that state. <coughs> and uh, I can't say that this is not a really accurate description of kind of awakening that, that Guan Yin is speaking of. Uh, but while I, I can imagine 
a state of merging with hearing, sound, and silence to where the self drops away. But I'm not sure I can imagine the moment where the sound itself drops away. That's just, that's me. And, you know, I confess my, uh, that I'm just still on that path. But what I do try to do, which is, which is really interesting, and you, you may try this yourself, um, while I'm sitting and hearing, I make an effort to hear the sound before I name it. That's, I'm not sure that's something you can actually do. It may be something that happens. Uh, and there's some sounds you can't identify because you can't identify, you know, because you, you have no point of reference for it. Uh, an example of that, some of you may have experienced, like, this is an old, this is now an old building. And depending upon the, you know, temperature and expansion and you know sometimes you're sitting here and there's this this crack and this is also like the the pebble against the uh the rake and the go on uh it's like a very sudden sharp sound and that strikes me before i put a name to it just the sharpness, the immediacy of it uh, is, is that way. Uh, but most things, at least I can put the, the general term bird or dog barking, I may not be able to identify it, but that, that activity of naming just happens really quickly. You know, uh, and I'm coming to accept that. I'm coming to accept that there's, uh, that's the way one's mind works. And to recognize there are also things that happen that happen, they do happen before you identify them, but you can't be looking for them. As long as you're looking for them, then, you, then uh, you're going to be layering in another mental activity. So often we don't look for what's happening in Zaza. Sometimes consciously we're doing something like giving ourselves Zaza and instruction. Uh, but sometimes we're just sitting, being receptive and thoughts arise. We don't even necessarily notice them. Uh, sensations, perceptions arise. That was just the crack that, <laughs> that I was talking about. It happens all the time. Um, so it's really important not to berate yourself for this process of uh, this almost automatic process of identification. This is, this is the very, really, really fast uh, mental process of like a perception, which so quickly zips down into your alaya vijnana, your store consciousness, to 
to make the identification and then zipping back up to the uh, to the seventh consciousness, the, the consciousness that is the well, it can zip up to this to the consciousness that is the I, the I making machinery. Or it can go just to the sixth consciousness where it's just something you hear that's not about you, but uh, so often we make it about ourselves. How can we not make it about ourselves? Uh, and how can we not make it about ourselves without judging ourselves for making it about ourselves? Without the, the judging is, is actually egocentric activity. So just hear, just listen, just accept what is coming in through those senses. Keep those senses open so that you're not sitting here for 40 years when something's going on and you don't hear it. So that you're not walking up the block all these years and missing the Cypress tree. Or the sound of the wind, any of that. This is the training that comes with Shikantasa. This is the training that comes with our, our Zazen. So with that, I am going to uh, stop and leave time for questions or comments. Uh, I hope this, let's point you towards a practice you can do. So uh, please uh, start looking in the Zendo and see if any of you have questions or comments. Mark. Thank you, uh, Ozani. Talk about opening our senses. And the Heart Sutra says no eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue, no sight, sound, smells. How does opening our senses arrive at no sight, no sound? I think that what Sojin was constantly teaching us was to include everything. What the Heart Sutra is providing is the other side, the other side of the traditional practices of, of really, of focusing, of mindfulness of, uh, of these senses. And it's saying, uh, I think, including everything includes both the, both eyes and no eyes uh, sound and no sound uh, and i think that's a what is no sound this is the side i think this is the side that that actually guan yin is speaking about in uh in the passage that i that i read and it, as i said i don't um I don't disagree with that, but I don't think I can look for it. You know, I think that the no eyes, no ears is just letting things happen without the active so it's so uh, I think of it as so when I talk about receptivity, uh, I think of it as 
seeing but not looking, hearing but not listening. So there's the receptivity and then there's the activity. And I think my understanding of the heart sutra is it's pointing us towards that, towards that receptivity rather than the uh, more active practices that might have been part of the methodology of uh, Buddhism before that time. Maybe. Anyhow, thank you. Karen? Isn't there a space between you hear a sound and then you talked about naming it? There's something in between that activity, or they're, they're not act there's a spaciousness. Uh, yeah, there can be, but often it's very subtle and very fast, and uh, I can't always, uh, I can't always locate that locate a space. You know, that, that's kind of what I'm uh, exploring. Uh, I, I believe that, that 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 is, but it's also one of the things that that communicates to me is how powerful the activities of mind and the activities of self are. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about this a lot. I'll, I'll talk about it uh, in the future, like, I've been reading Shinran, thinking about uh, the other power school, you know, and, and part of the thrust of Shin Buddhism is how much we are caught in this self-making machinery. And, you know, we may be, it posits, you know, we really can't deal with this. It's just happening all the time. It's only, only the Buddhas can uh, give us the space and the grace to hear that that distance. And if that happens, great. But um, yeah, it's, I think that it, it exists. And I'm sure that if they had uh, sensitive enough uh, analytic instruments to use to, me to measure your brain waves, you would see it. Well, I think, I think that can happen during Sashin, for yeah. example, or even probably these stories we read from the Blue Cliff Record, that moment of awakening. But um, that's, I think, Sashin really. Sashin slows down the processes of mind. Really, you know, in you know, strong Sashin, on you know, as as it goes on, they really slow down. You can, you know, so you get, you feel a sense of spaciousness in very much the way uh, a skilled musician is really attuned to the space between notes. That's exactly the same thing. Uh, Susan had her hand up, and then I need to turn to the, there's a bunch of hands here online. So. Okay, um, so uh, let's see. I'm seeing Nathan first, and let's see if my sound apparatus works. Thank you, Hosan. Um, you've spoken about this before, and it prompted me um, when I'm sitting to pay attention to what I'm hearing. Here in Seattle, the home of Boeing, the airplanes travel over the city, and there's a lot of airplane noise. And I have found that there are times I, I make an effort to separate or 
I'm not sure it happens before my mind has made that connection or not, but to hear the noise and to separate it from the idea that there are people traveling or a picture of an airplane and to just hear the qualities of the sound, um, which is pretty dramatic, actually, separate it from the idea of, oh, it's a plane. And I wonder if that effort is misplaced. It, it, sometimes it feels as though I can, I can hold off the, um, the arrival at the idea and the, the shorthand um, by just listening intently to the sound. But I wonder if, if, if that effort is, is just sort of misplaced and I've missed the boat and the connection was already made and I'm just kind of um, uh, fooling myself. Well, if the connection is made, that's okay. But I wanted to, but I would point out that uh, what I notice is uh, describing those uh, overpassing air, airplanes, you said noise. Uh, so there's a judgment embedded in that, I think. Uh, I mean, part of what I, just to say, Part of what I hear, and I heard it just as at the end of that minute that we were sitting, uh, there's there are airplanes coming over all the time that are landing in Oakland or taking off in Oakland. And uh, I don't hear them as noise. I hear them as sound and I investigate, I actually listen. Then I'm listening. I'm listening to the quality of the sound as it you know, as it comes and goes, you know, as you, as you, you track the frequency with the Doppler effect and all of that, I just, you know, just hearing it as sound. Uh, now, if I live someplace where this is happening all the time, all the time, uh, I think I would have a hard time avoiding uh, characterizing it as noise. But just Listen. Uh, just let it let it arise. Yeah. I think what a lucky person I am to live in Seattle, the home of Boeing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Jim. Good morning, Hosan. As you were talking about um, perceiving uh, without attaching signs to things, um, it occurred to me that that art, and maybe maybe especially contemporary art, is encourages a practice of seeing things in, in a new way, maybe without signs, and maybe to observe what signs we attach to things. Um, I wonder what your thoughts were about music being a musician um, in this regard? Well, it's interesting, uh, you know, our teacher, uh, Sojin was an abstract expressionist painter. Uh, and uh, so he was trained in that, in that field of kind of non-objective perception. Uh, and I think that was probably very helpful to him in, in framing his practice. For me, uh, even though I deal, the music that I play is um, very traditional in form, uh, parallel, you could say, to our Zen practice. Uh, but nonetheless, Whatever I'm feeling as I'm playing or singing a song may have almost nothing to do with what you are hearing or what is called forth in you. And uh, that's why uh, often songwriters are loath to interpret their own works. Uh, and I think that that's, that's a, a wise, uh, that's a wise effort, you know, because, yeah, it has, 
I am digging through my entire consciousness to either to write a song or even to sing a song. And you are digging through your entire consciousness when you listen to something. It's wonderful. You know, we may find that we have mutual resonances and maybe not, but neither, neither of us is in error about our perception. It's just, this is what Suzuki Roshi says, just accept, uh, accept what you're, what you're hearing. And you make an effort to try to understand what is being communicated, but still the communication is beyond that kind of one-to-one -one identification. So thank you. I had one more thing to say. Um, yeah. Like you're hearing in the uh, morning doves or Ross's noticing in the cypress tree, um, you made a distinction between listening and hearing. And I think we've all had experiences where we hear something almost as for the first time. I've never heard that color. I've never heard that, that phrase in the music before. So, yes, so it's a, in, in it's, I, I understand what I mean by the distinction between hearing and listening. I also understand that that's, there's a fluid boundary there, you know, now, it's like if I'm walking down the block and there's a morning dove, uh, I hear it and then I'm actually listening. You know, there's a, a pleasure in the identification as well. I'm going to, Susan? Or thank you. Susan. Um, thank you. What struck me most about your story, you know, hearing the morning dove, for the first time is, um, you know, that there's another side of that. Okay, like Sojin used to say, the whole world is doing Zazen. So there's this recognition. It doesn't have really anything to do with you or me or us. And right. the, the thing is the morning dove was also changed by your experience of awakening because now you care about the morning doves. That's right. And that seems to me what's key about our practice in terms of dealing with our, you know, our egocentric <laughs> self. You know, that that your care, our care includes, can include everything. Yeah. So I just wonder what you think about that. Well, another example, uh, I don't think until the pandemic, I ever really noticed and attended to the crows. <laughs> and I now feel really emotionally connected to those crows. <laughs> There's a lot of them. Uh, but I listen to them. I watch them. I actually, I talk to them, <laughs> you know, um, and again, okay, 35 years. And it's like the crows were there all the time. Uh, so I think that you could say, uh, that hearing, hearing might be the beginning of responsibility. That when you hear something, when you see something, and you, you feel a relationship to it, and you want to take care of it. The other thing that what I was getting from you, you didn't go there is I think what was uh, that those calls, they are calling, those calls are all an expression of relationality. Those animals are calling to each other, those birds are calling to each other. And that was what was, what was really amazing was like hearing these, 
these uh, morning doves in, in stereo, you know, and one was a little lower in pitch, one a little higher in pitch, and that they were, they were so clearly communicating uh, in a sort of call and response. I don't know what was, I don't know bird behavior, what was, what was going on there, but something was going on. And that's also, we, it's really important that we don't make this about us. We can use what we perceive, but we can use it to, to deconstruct our self-centeredness uh, and recognize and, and to, to move towards all-centeredness and to recognize these birds, these animals, they are in relationship. They have their own universe of relationship, which is wonderful. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take Judy, and I think I can take one more from the queue. I'm really, I'm sorry, uh, our time is going on, Judy. Yeah, uh, what you just said, um, I'm wondering how how we connect that to say a Claude on Shin Thomas, you know, who talked about surviving the Vietnam War, living with PTSD, and also as a priest and so on. But he still, when he hears a car backfire, he automatically ducks and covers. Mm -hmm. That's just in, in his body, no matter how long he's, he's practiced. And yet his response to that is first of all to share that story and then go from it towards healing and relationality. Um, I was in a lockdown about a week ago at an elementary school in Oakland um, because we heard boom, boom, boom. And when I was in the schoolyard, the teachers with me immediately looked up like they were tuning their ears. And one after the other, they said, I think the fire covers, but we still called 911. And all these kids have to go into a lockdown. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's happening now. And I wonder how this connects to that kind of relationality. Still have that something is in the body, so to speak. The relationality is really important to, to transform on every level. So how do we apply this practice she can talk about particularly? Meet that. Actually, I don't know. Um, and this would be a wonderful, I'm sure some of you would have responses. Um, you know, what I'm, what I'm talking about, what I've been talking about are opening experiences. What you're relating and by extension you know we're in talking about anshin and by extension of course we can we immediately think of uh think of what's happening in ukraine we think of what's happening around the world those are uh closing and protective experiences which are also so those are survival mechanisms you know there's nothing nothing wrong with them um but I think maybe the, for me, the immediately the common thread, if there is one, is just how finely tuned we are as beings to what we perceive and where we go and where this really just so finely tuned as, as organisms, the mechanism of, of uh, fight, flight, of safety, uh, risk, uh, this, is, this is organically built into us. Uh, and we have to be kind to it and not, not judge it, but you know, we also, we're trying to make a world where there's less of that even though this is the Saha world. So I'm just going to, Joe, and this is going to be the last, I'm afraid. Thanks, Ozan. 
um, <clears throat> somewhat relatedly, but I will ask it in my own way. Um, hearing the morning doves and seeing the cypress tree and then noticing them kind of elsewhere, these opening moments, um, th those seem kind of pleasurable experiences. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't feel like we have to do a lot with them. You know, the morning doves come and the morning doves go and we just just uh, open up to them. Uh, and then there's the experience of being opened up to suffering, opening up to something, something really uncomfortable, um, whether in ourselves or, or like, you know, encountering it with uh, our um, interactions with other humans. Um, and that feels more like we got to do something about it. You know, uh, we can't just, you know, let it go like the morning doves. Um, so it kind of relates to what you've been talking about, but I thought I'd just ask what you might be able to say about that. <clears throat> well, it just uh, responses at, at two levels. One, what immediately made me think about was uh, that I had an MRI this week, uh, which tests, it came out well, but it's like, you know, you're spending, I spent like 45 or 50 minutes in this very intense, very closed space with all this banging and clanging going on. It, you know, I wasn't scared. Uh, I wasn't entirely comfortable, but I actually could I could just, I felt myself, I mean, I think I used my practice to feel myself in the space and just hear, uh, just, you know, that these sounds were part of hopefully some process of healing. But anyway, it was not a comfortable space. But what the other, the other <laughs> thread is just to say what I was saying a moment ago, uh, to hear the crows, to see the crows, creates a sense of responsibility to perceive what's going on around you that might be harmful also creates, also rise, raises the question of one's responsibility. How does one live, how does one act to harmonize? And, uh, you know, recognizing that, you know, our actions may not work, they may fall short, but we do the best we can. This is a hard perception that that everyone is doing, that everyone is doing their best, even though we may think some of it is really, really misguided, but we have to do our best, whatever that is. And just to be grateful that we have this practice. That's where I'm going to end. Let's do the Bodhisattva vows. And uh, I'm happy to, you can email me while I'm happy to continue this discussion. Uh, I apologize, there seems to be a lot of questions, but thank you. I vow to become it. Beings are numberless. I vow to awaken with them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to end them. 